Teenage Welcome, everyone. I'm just going to go out and get a beer. Good evening. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Interesting. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Welcome to the Royal Society, or if you've um, been here before, welcome back to the Royal Society. My name is Arik Chowdhury. I'm Head of Policy here for Data and Digital Technologies, and I'm honored to be your host for the evening. So unless you've been living under a rock for the past year, you will have noticed that AI has become a major political issue. Next week, the UK will host the first Global AI Safety Summit to discuss some of the major challenges and opportunities AI offers the world. And today, the Royal Society has been hosting a series of events to help inform these discussions. In the morning, we held a joint session with the UK government to horizon scan AI safety risks across scientific disciplines, looking at everything from AI bias to AI peer review. This will both feed into the summit discussions and the report the Society is publishing next year called Science in the Age of AI. And in the afternoon, building off our 2022 report, The Online Information Environment, we held a red teaming exercise with the US nonprofit organization, Humane Intelligence, bringing together postgraduate students to test the scientific disinformation guardrails of a large language model. And tonight, um, we will be exploring a range of potential risks and benefits that AI poses to society. But first, we need to make some housekeeping announcements so if you go to any organization in the country, you'll be very unlikely to find any of them that do fire drills on Wednesday night. So if you do hear the fire alarm, it probably is the real deal, and at which point you should calmly follow the instructions of Royal Society staff and exit the building. And if you need a bathroom, you really should have gone before the event. <laughs> but if nature calls, they are down, out, out, out the door and down the steps in the basement. And finally, if you're on social media, um, please make some noise about the event. We had someone write in criticizing that we're promoting X, formerly Twitter, and just want to make clear that if you would like to make noise on whatever platform you prefer, Mastodon, Facebook, Threads, LinkedIn, TikTok, Tinder, whatever you prefer. <laughs> and if you want to submit a question, there are two ways to do so. You can submit a question at any time on Slido. You have to go on the, uh, if you just Google Slido, you'll find it. And you have to enter the number A2510. And you can just submit a question at any point during the evening, and you can upvote other people's questions um, that you would like to have heard in the Q&A. The second way you can do it is to wait till our Q&A session at the end, where we will have um, some raving mics. So I'm delighted to be joined on stage by a truly expert panel. We've got Anna Baccarelli, who's Technology and Human Rights Program Manager at Human Rights Watch. Ben Brooks, Head of Public Policy at Stability AI. Uh, Professor Gina Neff, Executive Director at the Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy. Louisa Bull, National Officer at Unite the Union. Subhanas Rashid Dia, founder of Tech Global Institute, which focuses on issues in the Global South. And she's come all the way from Bangladesh for this event, so definitely put some questions towards her at the end. I know she's nervous about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> finally, Professor John Crowcroft, uh, who's a fellow of the Royal Society and a professor of communication systems at the University of Cambridge. So first question, let's talk about language. So one of our reports, I'm gonna mention a lot of Royal Society reports this evening, by the way, and so take the hint and read them. Um, one of our reports in 2018 was on AI narratives, and it spoke within that report about the effect that language can have on contributing to consequences for AI research funding and regulation. And there's been lots of phrases recently. Um, AI, large language models, generative AI, foundation models, frontier AI models. So the first question is, what do these terms mean to you? And Ben, let's start with you, because I know before the event, this is something you actually raised, and I thought it was a good point. So um, is, is stable diffusion, the platform run by Stability AI, is that a frontier AI model? Are these words that you use in Stability AI? What are your thoughts on this question? We would like to think it is, um, but it is an image model, right? And I think if you look at the way frontier risk and frontier AI is described, it's usually in the language model context, and it's usually used in a way that implies a very small number of yet-to-be-developed models, models that can do, uh, have capabilities that introduce kind of catastrophic risks. Um, it's not a term that we use. It's not a term that, that guides how we think about our language model or image model or audio model development. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a challenging way to frame the 
public conversation about AI risk. Challenging for a few reasons. I think one of those reasons is it implies that these are, are new problems. Frontier risk, frontier regulation are new problems. They're not. I mean, fundamentally, what we're dealing with are questions of transparency, reliability, predictability, accountability that long predate 2023 and the generative AI hype cycle. I think the other reason it's challenging is because um, it, uh, it focuses on this kind of small basket of speculative risks mm. and ignores this uh, huge number of more immediate, more everyday risks that confront us today as developers, as deployers of AI, as users of AI. Um, and I think, well, you know, certainly this summit in its focus on catastrophic risk, I think there's a, a, a potential risk that we, we omit some of these other problems as well. Uh, and we can perhaps talk about this more, more tonight, but I think um, we would like to see a sustained commitment from government and from industry to addressing all of those risks, misinformation, disinformation, fraud, abusive content, product safety, not just these speculative existential risk kind of problems which have dominated the headlines for the past six to nine months. Um, John, you're a computer scientist. Do these words mean anything to you? Are these words that you use in your own uh, research? What are your thoughts? Um, not really. <laughs> uh, no, I think I, I, I completely concur with everything you just said. That was very, very succinct. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the risks have always been there, and I'm going to cite Reinhard Rogoff. Anyone know Reinhard Rogoff? That was a spreadsheet error and it predicted what you should do when there's an economic downturn and said you should do austerity. And then a grad student noticed there was an exactly wrong error in the spreadsheet, uh, too late for many countries that implemented austerity. So the output of the spreadsheet fed to a decision. So it was a decision support system that helped governments make, make a decision to implement austerity rather than borrow a lot of money and spend it on infrastructure. You did not need an AI, it was a spreadsheet. It literally, Excel, okay, I mean, that's like, <laughs> not even complicated statistics. Uh, and you can go and see the error, it's like public. So, um, so I think that the, the, the question there is, you know, do you verify something which has led to important decisions? Do you have transparency, agency, all those things? I think you just listed all of them, so I'm not gonna go through them all again. But in terms of, um, for me, the challenge with the new hype, which I personally think is rather strange that a bunch of governments have jump, jumped into doing a summit about it. We've had these issues for, for at least five years with the pervasiveness of AI being used in lots of ways, whether it is a spreadsheet or more intelligent ways of doing sentencing, all the things we know that there are horror stories about, but also some good things in medical diagnosis and so on. All those things have been around. This is masking that, but it's also masking it in a bad way, which is there are two aspects of the current hype technology, which are not true of most of the previous technologies we've had. Um, for example, even relatively large convolutional neural nets are explainable. Uh, DeepMind did a really nice project with Morpheus Eye Hospital doing retina eye scans and doing diagnosis, a feature, you know, literally classifying what was wrong with the person based on 50,000 images. They had a really good precision and recall, but they could also explain what the diagnosis was, which cases in the training data led to that. And many of the systems we've had for since Jeff Hinton started almost 30 years ago or more, and other systems, Bayesian modeling, all kinds of other systems, are open to explainability, interpretability, quantifying their uncertainty, all these things that are really essential if you put them in any place where they lead to important decisions or they even more crucially actuate something in the physical world, potentially, uh, where they move something that opens floodgates or turns left or over a cliff or whatever it happens to be. Um, so. Uh, so I think this, this bunch of terminology is, is hiding behind some superficial things that can be done, which look groovy. Um, actually, the image stuff is much sweeter. The stable diffusion is probably much more amenable to some kind of explanation of what happened in there. But some of the few shot um, super large training data set, high dimensionality system, how are you gonna make those interpretable and quantify uncertainty? probably not doable in any sustainable way, and it's not, not generally obvious what they're useful for. If we get away from all that noise and say, what are the things we're using, then we find we can use a bunch of the te techniques which would then make them far more attractive and avoid all these risks. Um, on, if, you, if we can have the conversation about existential risk from AI, but I think this is mostly driven by 
misreading science fiction film scripts and not noticing that actually <laughs> Arnie actually saved the humans and Skynet lost. It's really important to remember that. Most of the, most of the end is the AI loses, but, but let's, let's not have, we can talk about that in a bar later. Uh, Gina, you've been very involved in some of the pre-summit activities. How, how have you heard these words being used? What does it mean to you? So I want to bring our attention to the word foundation model because when, you know, our, our language does matter and the choice of words matter. And when we use the words foundation model, we really are thinking about the platforms on which other kinds of goods and services are built. And I think John's example of uh, a spreadsheet error being uh, used to, for 30 years to justify an economic policy um, is, a, is a signifier of the kinds of choices that get embedded into the things other people build upon. So my team um, at the Minderu Center for Technology and Democracy, along with the Bennett Institute of Public Policy at Cambridge and AI at CAM, which is a Cambridge-wide AI initiative, released a report last week about what the UK's policy in generative AI should be. And we really drilled down on this idea of the foundation model, because when you think about some of the questions and some of the risks that we're looking at, and I don't mean existential risks, I mean, you know, what are the, what, what's being built today is the infrastructure for companies to use tomorrow. Okay, well, what's that infrastructure? Who's accountable for that? And are we building new kinds of monopolies? Are we building new kinds of systems that simply will power the digital societies of the future? And if we're doing that, that's the foundation on which we will live our digital lives and other companies will I'm not going to use the verb force, but other companies will, will be guided into making their own decisions, then we are building the foundations of the digital future. And that then brings up these questions about power. Those are questions that aren't on the table at the summit. Those are questions that are not the kinds of things that are motivating bringing people together, countries together in Bletchley Park next week. But it is something that I think is very interesting to people in the room. It's very interesting to the audiences I talk to. So it's this kind of notion that there are questions of how we are remaking our economies, how we are remaking our societies. Those questions are not the questions we're talking about, but it's the reason why the public is so interested in what we're looking at. So it's, so it's, not, the, it's not maybe the bad science fiction, right? It's the science fiction where there's one or two or five powerful companies who dictate the terms of the economy going forward. Let's go to Dia. So Dia, you're here representing the four billion people in the global south. <laughs> <laughs> A statistic I got from ChatGPT, so you might want to verify it on google.com. Um, in the Global South, uh, are we having similar conversations like this? Is this a concern amongst the public in the same way it's been in the UK and the US and, and Europe? And do they use these kinds of terms like foundation models? Or is that translated into to other parts of the world? Yeah, I mean, I think AI has become a concern for governments around the world. Um, you know, we work extensively with governments in Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and across the board, um, AI has come up in different, different ways. But I think the challenge is, and what we're seeing also in the UK is that these terms are being interchangeably, right? So using foundation models versus generative AI versus frontier AI, it's almost being used as the same thing in many cases without clear definitions. And I think that's doing a disservice to what you're actually trying to regulate. Is, are you trying to regulate foundation models? Are you trying to regulate generative AI? Like, I think there's a, and it's really important for different kind of policymakers across the board to align on these definitions because otherwise, um, it gets really hard, one, to define what you're trying to regulate, second, to actually have that regulate be interoperable, because the technologies that you're trying to regulate are global in nature, they're across national borders, so you can't have different definitions and therefore different kinds of provisions, and then finally, um, regulations that are impossible to actually implement, and that's kind of the challenge that we're seeing in different parts of the world. I think the other aspect of that is, um, you know, because these terms are being used interchangeably and there's this almost like a gold rush to regulate, uh, so, at different points without really having clear 
alignment around definitions, around the risks, around the harms. Everybody, every government around the world is putting together a proposal on the table. And these proposals are not talking to each other. And so you are in a situation where, you know, when, when we are going and speaking with somebody in Brazil versus someone in India, they're, they have the same basic idea of what the risks are, but they're doing it in very different ways. And therefore, if you are a company trying to comply in two different geographies, you just can't because you're not you're not sort of um, agreeing on the, on the same premise, and therefore it's quite impossible for you to figure out what to do, and I think, and I think it, that, that does a huge disservice to the public, because a government's job is to govern systems, to make it explainable, reliable, trustworthy, but when you can't agree on the basics, then you're essentially giving the, you're basically not doing res your duty to the public. So, Louisa, um, in the trade union movement, so often this is talked about in terms of automation, has there been any sort of change in thinking over the past year with chat GPT and all the other conversations around AI? Yeah, I mean, I guess what everyone's been saying, the worker's perspective on that to me seems to be fundamentally the most important. What does it mean to us as workers? What does it mean to us as citizens? And um, what it's called doesn't particularly bother me because I'm not going to understand it anyway. I need to understand what is that going to do to somebody in the workplace? Or is that, what's that going to mean to me on my mobile phone? How is that invading my life and my, my members' lives? And what, what is owned? Automation, innovation, it's always here. It's been here forever. I worked in printing 30 years ago and innovation came and went and moved on. So trade unionists are not frightened of innovation, but they want collaboration and transparency, safeguards around that. You know, we're not even invited to the summit. Civil society and trade unions have not got a voice in that room. And that is, to me, a big mistake. But, you know, we will work with employers, we will work with industry, and we will work with everybody that we need to to ensure that our agenda is in that room or, or on the table. But I accept what you're saying. It's got to be global. We're a global federation. We talk at European level. I meet my colleagues at European level to discuss this. We have a global agenda for workers, but we don't seem to have a global agenda across business and governments, and that's what's, what's, what's needed. And I've left you with a very difficult task here, which is to, to add anything on what's been said or, or think about, um, you know, has this changed the sort of language or thinking around human rights issues and AI? Is there anything particularly novel that's come out in the past year that's changed your, your thinking at Human Rights Watch? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, on the language question, I think, you know, consistency is key, just so that, we, you know, we're debating the same terms. I think getting into the specifics is actually a welcome change from talking about AI as an umbrella term, because we can actually dig into the nuts and bolts of what does this do. Um, but the one, the one thing we need to kind of, I think, look towards more is context. So, you know, how are these models applied and, you know, developed in terms of like products or, you know, how do, how do they land in people's everyday lives? Without context, I think it's very, very difficult to talk about regulation that is, you know, that, that matters to people, that is accountable to people. Um, and yeah, on the human rights side, I mean, we've been documenting the impact of AI on, you know, various sectors and societies um, for the last, I don't know, eight years or so. Um, I think in terms of a change in the past year, what we're seeing with particularly generative AI is, um, I think, I mean, on our side, we have a sort of like verification and kind of documentation of human rights abuses that is really suffering with generative AI, just in terms of sort of gathering evidence and kind of documentation of abuses. Obviously, the, the crisis in Israel and Gaza is, um, you know, the most kind of recent example of that. Um, and I think in future, that's, you know, really something that we're thinking about in the human rights movement is, you know, how do we preserve and verify information? Great. Okay, so next question. So the Royal Society today has been focusing a little bit on disinformation because of our 2022 report, the online information environment. Don't forget to read it. Um, because that, that's, for us, that's a, uh, an area of research that most closely fits into the, the AI safety uh, theme. So other than disinformation, what do you consider to be um, the key AI safety risks in the short to medium term? And let's start with you, John. In terms of generating disinformation? No, sorry, everything other than disinformation, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes. Because. Yes. There's trying two to make sides you think here. I'm trying to make you think hard. The other problems with generative AI. Or just AI, in, you know, as you see, and what do you consider to be AI safety risks from your perspective? I guess is the question. 
I think there's a, um, one of the problems is the uh, public understanding of what's happening. And so what's beneath the hood is getting more complex. It's always been complex. I mean, you could have a PhD in microelectronics and not know how your mobile phone works, right? So it's like, you know, that's pretty astonishing. And actually, I think one of the first things that's real AI was Google Maps. You know, where you have a GPS system and you have a phone with a assisted GPS receiver and you have this map data, it's astonishing the number of algorithms that are going into making that thing work. And I actually do know how most of that works, but it's, you know, it's, most people probably don't. Um, um, and that's not being patronized, and they've got more interesting things to do, like you can watch the next you know, episode of Loki or whatever it happens to be. Um, so, sorry, I'm a science fiction freak. Um, so, um, I, I think, I think that, that, that for me, just sort of going back to, to answers, just going back to actually the previous speaker, a really nice use of, of LLMs I came across was the UN was working on simplifying um, legal documents for refugees getting into Ethiopia, Yama, and uh, Afghanistan, various countries. And one person with, I think it was um, a hugging face, uh, Lama Mistral 7, was running this, and it took, in multiple languages, with the Mozilla Open Voice Protocol, was able to have people speak the facts. It would then fill in the documents, speak the whole document back to a human sitting there as a lawyer, would check it, and to the person in a simplified form that they would check in Swahili or Ethiopia or Arabic or whatever. That's a really cool use of AI. Um, and notice what I said there, though, that there were two humans. There was an expert and the subject, the user. And this is this is very attractive use of that technology. But the, 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 the the, the, the bit that's important there was, you know, that there were two humans. It was intensely oriented around uh, the user. It was centered around them, including voice interface, because they might not be able to read and write, uh, and having another person who would assist with checking, so the verification, not requiring you to do something which at the moment is very hard to do with systems I already talked about, systems like that. In, in other worlds where we connect large complex AI systems to physical systems, cyber physical systems been around for a long time. Things like autopilots have done this for a long time. We'll notice that Boeing had a major incident when they didn't include users in the redesign of an autopilot and they changed the user interface without retraining people. But actually autopilots are generally, as a piece of software, super safe because they're verified, but they're also put into wrappers. And we do this with trading software and stock markets and you can even have trusted third parties will run a number of algorithms in a secure environment and check they don't interact in bad ways. This is also done by medical agencies in France. They did this with, uh, with drugs and side effects and they ran up whole bunch of experiments with virtual versions of everything to see what interactions were. So these are all things that we should be doing more of because the, um, they are doable, they don't cost a lot more, they get rid of all the problems of later being found liable, they give you mechanisms for redress when you see something does go wrong, they do all those things. So for me, that's, there's a whole bunch of, sort of, I'm just trying to feed in some positive story here. I think there's a lot of good things we could do. There are some good things being done and they usually are good because they include these factors which when people ignore them, then you know, it's at their peril. Um, and, and I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna do a Neil Lawrence here, but he used a 3D printed widget in the house. Lords, but I'm going to quote Shakespeare. He said, there's no art to find the mind's construction in a face. So he was talking about humans and misrepresenting things. But when you use an AI, you have no side channel information about what's happening. You have no back channels information to who created the AI, what they used to train it, all those things. You can create all those things. So you could put a face on the AI. And in my example with the UN refugee problem, there are actually multiple faces, voices put on this system, which was very, very cool. Because then you got to get two people look at each other and a person getting help from free for a bono for help from a lawyer was like, wow, that's really useful. That just did the thing, right? So so I think there are ways forward um, which you know which which involve more clever thinking about technology for researchers like me, that's great because we'll have a, we'll have a job for life, right? So that's good. <laughs> but we'll also be able to say it was useful too. So. Um, Anna, so do, do you have any thoughts on like positive uses and or your experience and again also um, your views on what you consider to be the key AI safety risks? Yeah, no, I'm not anti-tech. <laughs> like, the positive uses are absolutely fantastic. You know, we've used um, machine learning um, at Human Rights Watch. Previously, I was at Amnesty. We used machine learning there, you know, both kind of like uh, sort of image, like satellite sort of imagery uh, scraping, as well as kind of LLMs and some of our, you know, kind of background kind of data gathering. 
absolutely not anti-tech. I think, you know, we just want safeguards in place. And obviously, when it's used in um, particularly high-stakes scenarios, then, then that's what we really care about. And um, at Human Rights Watch, we've been documenting the impact of the welfare state for some time and, and um, automation in the welfare state. And so um, a, a couple of case studies I can cite. One is universal credit here in the UK, and the second is um, TACAFL in um, Jordan. And in both cases, um, you have an algorithmic system that is gathering lots of data points. Um, in the case of TACAFL, it was like 57 different data points. Um, assessing benefits claimants um, for their eligibility, and then you know making a decision. Um, you know they, they don't know what that is and um, what what criteria has gone into that, and then you know either issuing benefits or not. Um, in both cases, we found a lot of similarities in terms of problems. So. Um, just a kind of very crude reading of information that doesn't account for the complexity and kind of changing circumstances of someone's life. In the case of universal credit, kind of famously, um, it didn't, it sort of, anyone that was paid twice in a month, they were counted as having a double payment, so your universal credit was, uh, you know, significantly decreased, your, your payment account, because it was sort of assessed on a monthly basis. It doesn't matter whether people were sort of paid on an informal basis or ad hoc, which is obviously um, kind of more uh, likely to be a kind of lower social economic status. Um, but, or if someone's payment had been brought forward from a month, say, because it was bank holiday or there was a weekend, for example. And so that just kind of crude assessment, I know that it's, it's been rectified in some cases. Um, if you are monthly salaried, then that is fine. But, it, but still, if you have multiple payments coming in and um, you are not on a monthly salary, your UC will be docked or you know, impacted based on that decision. It just doesn't account for real life. It, the same with, with Jordan. Um, you know, most recently, we found that um, people that owned a car, for example, were being penalised um, in, this, in this sort of collection um, of data. Yeah. So that didn't, obviously, it, um, sort of negatively impact people in rural areas. It didn't account for if you haven't used a car because you can't afford to run it. You know, if you need a car because you, you know, live miles from anywhere and so on. So it just all of this kind of like crude data which is being fed into a system which impacts people's lives and they have no real sense of like how decisions are being made, how to challenge them as well and also the kind of like the digital lit literacy that's involved in these systems and um, you know it really kind of disproportionately uh, negatively impacts certain parts of the population. In Jordan people needed to um, often uh, pay for a bus fare to go to a shop um, to then pay to use a municipal computer or a smartphone, for example, to even apply for the benefit in the first place. So that's like a down payment. They may not get it back. So all of this kind of thing is like incredibly mundane. It is not what is going to be discussed at the summit next week, I imagine. But this is the, the kind of nuts and bolts of life that impacts real people. And this is how AI is being deployed, whether it's across welfare, whether it's across policing, whether it's across you know, asylum applications, that is, you know, the impact on people's lives and it's happening now as well. So, you know, I think I'm glad that we're talking about AI and accountability. I mean, it feels to me somewhat overdue and it's great that it's in the spotlight. I just really want to kind of shift the spotlight to something that's a bit more realistic. So a couple of themes coming out, explainability, accountability. Gina, you, didn't, you do a lot of work on these areas. Do you have any thoughts on uh, potential potential remedies to these questions, and again, also your views on uh, what you consider to be the key AI safety risks. Yeah. Um, people are the key AI safety risk. I, I, let's just name it, right? Let's name it what it is. And I, I can say that a little glibly, forgive me, but I truly mean it, right? Um, we can have a summit about the risks of models, but we have to remember these models are people all the way down, right? They're built, they're run, they're profiting, they're, they're run on people, right? So when we talk about the risks of these systems, you know, one of the pain points, um, one of the weak links in cybersecurity terms is always the human in the system. So let me give a couple of examples. Our friends at Data and Society Research Institute, along with uh, Duke Medical, ran a series of studies about a new 
sepsis detection tool that was rolled out in a US research hospital. And this was done by an internal um, innovation team. This sepsis, if any of you know, is a terrible condition. It uh, kills people in hospitals. And it's treatable if caught early. But the challenges are often really busy um, emergency rooms, A&Es, um, busy hospitals don't have the resources for that early detection. So they rolled out um, a, a machine learning tool to help identify and classify patients as at risk of sepsis. But they didn't call it AI. Why? Because the nurses in charge would not understand what they needed to do with their own expertise if it were named AI. They needed the nurses to still be there to advocate for each and every one of their patients and to have their own professional judgment in the system. They were worried about nurses saying, oh, the AI has told us this patient's not at risk, so now my professional judgment is not necessary. That's a real safety risk in an everyday situation that we're seeing right now in ophthalmology, in retinal scanning that's happening in this country. Anyone who gets their wonderful eyes scanned at wonderful boots, yay, boots, opticians. Um, you know, the, 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 we have a, a wealth of retinal image data in this country that it can be used to help early detection of a whole host of diseases, right? but we are at risk of diminishing the professional expertise and training of systems. Let me give you another example, robotic surgery. Great, fabulous advances, robotic surgery. You know, we can think of surgery by robots, but really think about wonderful kind of more precise tools that experienced surgeons use, right? Great, wonderful. How do they train those tools? Well, they train them on the simple cases, right? They train them on the straightforward kinds of procedures and processes that junior doctors used to do, junior surgeons used to do. And in a paper by our colleagues in Cornell, they found that those junior surgeons are having to fight for the training opportunities in hospitals. They're like, wait a second, guys, that easy stuff that you've turned over to training the robotic surgery arm, um, we used to do that. Now, where are we going to get our training and expertise? And so the organizations that I talk to, from public sector organizations to um, government regulators to cell phone users. That's what happens when you get a computer scientist or phone. This, <laughs> <aren't any of> <laughs> this is what I'm saying. People so. are the weak link. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, but you know, so for all of these organizations, they're really struggling about how they build their capacity. Right now, in workshops we have with regulators, regulators don't quite know how we're going to roll out the UK's own approach. Proportionate, sensible, yes. Sectoral, yes. By each regulator, yes. Probably the best way, go Team UK, probably the best way to regulate a AI. They don't know how they're going to staff it. So we've got a lot of work to do to building up the social human capacity. It's both people understanding what's going on underneath the hood, yes. But frankly, I don't understand how my car works. But I know I'm licensed to drive. I know what guardrails are. And I know when that check engine light goes on what I am supposed to do. And right now, the check engine lights for some of our complicated models are not apparent and transparent to those of us who are going to be making our professional decisions based on their output. So we've got a lot of work to do to build up that capacity. And frankly, that's the conversation that I would love to see taken up at the summit, right? Where are we having the conversation about building out that capacity so we can, as societies, be safer? The check engine light in my car is permanently on. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good segue to Louisa. So, um, you know, another theme here is training and people. Uh, how are you thinking about this at Unite? And I know you're also involved in the Trade Union Congress work. And I can you talk a little bit about that? And then again, also your view on 
what you consider to be the key AI safety risks? Yeah, so the, um, the TUC have obviously been working on this for a few years and have had their own AI task force led by, a great, led by a great woman, Mary Towers. But we've had our manifesto, and that talks about all the areas where we think these issues are going to impact workers in, in the workplace. And you just talked about some of the, you know, higher technical um, skills and roles. But, you know, I'm going to take you down to... A, a, a guy or a girl working in a warehouse with a headset on, picking and packing. Now, that has all been automated for many years. The decision on how quickly they need to pick, where they need to pick, and what they need to pick is all told to them on the, on the phone. They've got no power, no mm. control, and they are automatically disciplined if they miss the target. doesn't matter what size, shape, health they've got. If they've got to pick up a box of Coca-Cola or a box of paper, everyone has to pick it up at the same time from the same spot and get it back to the lorry by the same moment. And the fact that they've not got any power within that and no ability to change that is commonplace in, in work. And that is having a real impact on people's health and, um, and mental well-being, right? So that is a very simplistic example of where the trade union movement have got our manifesto, what we believe we need to do in collaboration with our employers. Bringing in these systems is great. They're helpful. They're useful. But we need to know that there's a human in control. And also a worker can go to a human to appeal that process if they need to. And that's not happening right now. The systems are coming in under the ground. We're not consulted. We've got no right to ask. We've got no information and consultation rules around that. And that needs to change. You have the right in this country to bargain. You have the right to bargain on pay hours and holiday. And that's what the trade union movement do. But we need to be able to bargain on these systems, on data. And we need to know what's going into a company, how it impacts us as workers. And we need the right to ask, the right to know, and the right to agree to that before it happens. So, Ben, um, in some people's eyes, AI safety risks are stuff that's happening on platforms like Stable Diffusion sort of harmful content. Um, is, that, is that what kind of thinking goes on within Stability AI when it comes to addressing some of those harms? What are your views on it? And then also, what do you consider to be the, the key AI safety risks? Well, I think both parts of that question have the same answer, which is um, there are many kinds of misuse that industry, government, the public are having to grapple with that don't fall into this category of existential frontier risk. Um, there's a lot we can do. There are layers of mitigation that we can put in place for that misuse. As a model developer, as an application deployer, as users, um, as, as the rest of the information ecosystem, the social media platforms, there's a lot that can be done there to um, prevent the misuse of these systems for abusive, misleading, fraudulent, harmful purposes. But there isn't a silver bullet. And I think sometimes there's a tendency, particularly this year, to look at AI as if it's this big kind of monolithic technology, <laughs> and 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 you miss, um, you obscure the complex supply chain that sits behind that. And if we're going to seriously mitigate those kind of risks, that kind of misuse, we need accountability and we need regulation and we need mitigation right across that supply chain. It's not just going to happen. In the models, it's not just going to happen in the compute. It's not just going to be laws governing users. It's going to be some combination of all of these things. Um, so that's on the, the misuse piece. And, and we do a lot, and I can talk to that as well, in terms of dealing with some very immediate risks that, that we see. I think there's another risk, um, or, or a kind of short-term, medium-term harm, which is um, product safety. You know, when someone builds the WebMD chatbot, or when a consumer bank starts using language models to make investment decisions with deposits. <laughs> what safe and fair means in those contexts will be very different. We need regulators who are well-resourced and have a mandate to start developing performance requirements for those um, use cases and those domains. Um, and it's, it's not as sexy as existential risk and frontier risk and all the rest of it, but very, very quickly, uh, we need to have in place guardrails for what product safety means in these very, very different, very diverse environments. Um, the final piece I'll add, because it doesn't get any airtime, um, <laughs> is the risk of, of a collapse of competition in this space. Mm. And Gina actually made this point earlier. You know, 
AI as a technology has the potential to centralize economic value creation in a way that almost no other technology has of the past 20 years. And we have lived for 20, 25 years through a digital economy that has one search engine, two or three social media platforms, three or four mm -hmm. cloud compute providers. And there's a serious risk that we're going to repeat some of these mistakes again in AI unless we think about competition as a policy <coughs> priority. And what does that mean in practice? Well, it means for one thing that AI won't just be two or three Bay Area labs producing models that the rest of the economy depends on for the next 10 or 20 years. It's going to be open source. You will have open source capabilities, open source technologies that any public sector agency, any small business, any researcher at a university can take from GitHub. They can adapt it, they can customize it, they can make it better, they can make it safer, and they can figure out how to deploy it safely in a real world environment. That's the future that we want to see. And so we release our models openly. Our language models have been downloaded over seven or eight million times since, I think, May of this year. These aren't users, these are developers who are trying to figure out what to do with it. And they're trying to build capabilities uh, uh, in a way that doesn't depend on a third party big tech company. So I think, I think that's a serious risk as well. And when it comes to when we, you know, frontier risk, existential risk, and that kind of conversation, there's a risk that we fear monger our way into a kind of statutory duopoly where only two or three <coughs> companies uh, have the uh, license, in some cases, a statutory license to build this technology. And that is just as scary to me as a world of Skynet and, and Terminator. Um, <laughs> So I think, I think we need to think very carefully about if this frontier risk, existential risk conversation leads to legislative and regulatory action, how do we make sure that that supports a diverse, thriving AI ecosystem with corporate labs, as well as grassroots developers, closed source technology, open source technology, big models, small models, and everything in between, uh, and move away from this worldview that has kind of taken hold over the past six months of AI being two or three big labs threatening to destroy the world and, and asking for kind of statutory licenses and other things um, to, to prevent harm. So I think, I think that's another risk as well that doesn't get a lot of air time. There's an interesting report, I think by the Internet Watch Foundation today, which is talking about um, AI generated um, pedophilia content of celebrities. It made me think about novel Risks and uh, have you come across any sort of novel human rights risks that have come out, come out um, in the past year? And again, also, what do you consider to be the the key AI safety risks? I mean, I think in terms of novel risks, we could probably talk about generative AI if it's the past year. And I would say the big worry on our mind and our sort of within Human Rights Watch, and I think also from speaking to you know, uh, focus in tech companies is what happens around the elections and there's a big bunch of them looming next year. So I think, you know, that's... And, and then you can go into what is the novel risk there? Is it a chatbot pretending to be a representative? And you, you could look at different applications. I mean, I think to understand the human rights impact of something, you've really got to look at a use case. And so for me, you know, the, the foundation and sort of... Um, model layer is is all well and good, but like what happens when that's applied in practice? And all AI, you know, ends up in a product of some kind. And so that's the stuff that we're kind of really interested in is like, you know, yes, there's the technical safety components, but, you know, I'm sitting here with a human rights hat on. So it's like, how how is that going to, you know, impact potentially my access to rights? And then also, you know, we mentioned supply chain. What is the, what's going into that? Um, the creation of said product. Um, you know, particularly this year, I think there's been um, a welcome focus on the the employment rights of like data labelers and you know everyone kind of in that sort of life cycle that was I think formally sort of confined to the sidelines. They weren't thought of tech, as tech workers. You know, there's a there's a real difference between someone in say in Nairobi like labeling data or like a moderating like the worst parts of the internet you know kind of taking down graf graphic content or whatever and say uh, you know white collar tech workers in silicon Valley. but i think now we are thinking of that a little bit more as a supply chain so i'd really encourage us to also think of the kind of like employment rights at the very sort of start of that as well 
Sorry, what was there? Was that? <laughs> yeah, that was a good, that was, that was a, that? a good compliment yeah. answer. Okay. Um, <laughs> so during this morning's um, session on horizon scanning, we looked at um, uh, AI being trained on weird populations. It was my phrase of the week, which is Western educated, industrialized, <laughs> something, <laughs> rich, rich and demo, demo, democratized, yes, yeah. populations. And... Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting conversations there around what that means for the global south, what it means for um, different populations if these programs are rolled out globally. And also, just touching on, on that point on data labelling, do, do you have any thoughts on those issues, dear? Because those have been in the news a lot, especially with the, the labelling of this content, and also your views on what you think the, the key AI safety risks are. Yeah, um, I think, um, Anna, you kind of raised a really good point, Ron. And uh, it goes back to your earlier question around definitions, right? I think AI as a system has existed quite, for quite a long time. So I think we need to really start by thinking about automated systems. I think that's the starting point of the conversation. When we go into generative AI, frontier models, you kind of lose the crux of the problem, and then you're not really working around solving that sort of issue. So if you really take automated systems as the crux of it, I mean, the Global South has been disproportionately impacted by it for a very long time. The Jordan example is a really good one, but in the social credit scoring, employment choices, um, potentially how they're being represented in other kinds of media. I mean, the Global South has historically been excluded, and therefore what you end up with through automated systems is a very reductionist view of the Global South. And you know, it was a joke at the beginning that I re I'm representing four billion people, but essentially that's what it is. You have one image that represents everybody in the world, right? And I think there was a really interesting report that was done by Rest of World recently that looked at um, image generation, not stable diffusion, others as well, uh, but in general, all kind of image, gener uh, sort of image generative um, AI systems, and it was trying to put questions like, you know, average Nigerian man, um, average Indian man, and like, it really kind of produced images and content and, and um, responses that really boiled, to, boiled down to the worst stereotypes about those populations, right? And that's really, really harmful because in the long run, you know, and it's the and it's, and it's same as some, 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 like the Google search, like when you're Googling, when you're searching something on Google, which is also an automated system, you're essentially only finding one version of the story because that's coming up on page one and page two, and you're, not, and you're missing out on the entire sort of whole range of other kinds of information. So with systems that are that rapid and trained based uh, on, on biased data, you're essentially getting responses and images that again goes back into the worst stereotypes, only a singular you know, narrative about the entire global sub, which is really harmful. But I think Ben kind of touched on, on something in terms of the AI safety risk, which is really kind of taking it um, to the supply chain, right? And, and really, uh, and recognizing that models don't exist in vacuum, they exist because people design them and make decisions behind them. There are people who are deciding what data goes in, what data goes out, how you're gonna train a model, how you're gonna design it, how you're gonna deploy it, how you're going to govern it. Those are human-made decisions. So I think the biggest AI safety risk in many ways are the people behind it, because they're not, they are making a deliberate choice to exclude certain parts of the world uh, because it's, it's, you know, it's more profitable to do it or because you know, it's just an easier thing to do. And then you're releasing models into the world that gives really factually wrong and historically inaccurate information. So I think really recognizing that entire spectrum is really important and really going, to the, going down to the supply chain, it's not just the application layer, but also like the data layer, the supply chains, um, understanding you know, how the labor practices are being impacted because of data labeling, content moderation, how you're sourcing the data once you have the data, then how you're actually designing the program. And I think just having human rights due diligence across the entire supply chain and the, and the complexities around it is really critical because when there's so much focus at the application layer, you're kind of not really solving the problem at all. It's gonna be very superficial, it's gonna be not sustainable, and that's gonna be a challenge. And I think the other sort of, I mean, in terms of the systemic um, sort of the safety risk is a bit around you know, how it's being regulated. Because again, because that conversation is entirely being dominated by a couple of companies um, in the West, uh, predominantly in the US, and because the legislative environments that they exist in are, are more mature, 
you're essentially extrapolating the same legislative, legislative instruments or legal instruments across the world. And so you have a situation where you have patents, for example, that are exclusive in the US, and then if anybody's trying to develop models on the basis of it, they can because it's a patent violation, right? Or you have a situation where you're bring, where you're kind of copy-pasting legal instruments to regulate at the model level, and then you have a situation where local companies in Nigeria or Kenya or Bangladesh can't even um, comply with those requirements and therefore they're being killed. And so you're actually killing competition in that way. So I think this, this idea that you have this very sanitized, um, you know, one country view of how AI is being designed, deployed, what data you're collecting is essentially creating a lot of ripple effects across the world, which is essentially excluding an entire um, population. Uh, and I would say the majority of the population because that's like, what, 4 billion people out of 7 billion people in the world. So that's, that's really problematic. Just a reminder that 4 billion is from ChatGPT, yeah. so please verify. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But it's actually, there's a really important point in there around, we've become accustomed to thinking of trust and safety in tech as being something that you, you, you hire up two or 400 trust and safety people in your big tech company and then that's how you deal with trust and safety. The reality with AI and a whole bunch of other algorithmic technology is it's gonna be deployed by tens or hundreds of thousands of businesses and organizations around the globe and we need all of them to be resourced with the standards, the research, the tooling to implement this stuff safely. So what we really don't want to see it, coming out of this summit or the task force or any of these other initiatives is a world in which trust and safety is kind of exclusive to upstream companies mm -hmm. making the models. Mm -hmm. We want to see resourcing so that everyone across that supply chain and everyone across that ecosystem can implement this stuff safely. And we haven't really seen a commitment from any of the large jurisdictions to help make that happen. Um, and that's gonna be critical if we want to see AI deployed safely, not just in the San Francisco Bay Area, but to see it safely deployed across the global south, across small businesses here at home. Yes, but it's risky for small, medium enterprises, for startups to build on technologies that they don't have clear legal, regulatory, IP oversight in terms of what's going on. So we call for, in our report on generative AI for UK policy, UK policy on generative AI, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you know, we call for getting that clarity in the UK jurisdiction around ensuring that companies know what is coming for them. So for example, let's imagine there is a model that there may be challenges on the intellectual property issues of the inputs that were used to build that. If I'm a company and I'm using that to build my products and services, what's my legal liability? Right now, we don't know the answer to that. We're not gonna unlock that innovation in this country that is possible. We're not gonna see the kinds of um, growth in small startup companies that we do so well in the UK based on these foundation models until we get some clarity around what that legal regulatory environment looks like on the underlying foundational technologies that they're, that they're relying on. So there, there it can't just of, be their responsibility. A couple of things in the supply chain. Royal Society actually had an event not that long ago with um, a number of companies and the BBC talking about provenance of data, and particularly in the world of generative That's an AI. excellent report on that. Excellent yes. report. <laughs> and, but unfortunately, unfortunately, it was exactly in this world where the usual suspects were the companies who were going to build the technology mm -hmm. for the provenance and track it and do the audit trailing. Um, on the other hand, the ICO a few years ago wrote a fantastic report about data trusts, which actually talked all about what might happen with ownership. And a good example in the UK would be NHS patient record data, which should really be a trust, which we are all shareholders, all subjects, and we own. And when Google DeepMind builds an AI based on it, given the software is about 0.01% of the effort and the data, and particularly label data labeled by surgeons and experts, is the high value, then at UK NHS PLC should own 99.999% of that application and make lots of money when we sell it to US healthcare private companies or whoever. And that's the, that, the inequity of what's happening, both, I've just given two examples, of just that that's just not what's happening, which is terrible. And any 
mark it with an invisible hand will not arrive at that point, right? So this is, if you want, the regulator of choice who should be at the summit next week. It will be market regulation people. I think several people here have alluded to that being an aspect, and, and civil society and unions as representing workforces in exactly the same argument applies, I think. That's already happening to the UK's largest retinal image database. Mm -hmm. So yeah. millions of retinal scans now sit in a, in a public trust and, and the first licenses are being negotiated. And it is the community oversight board who are helping to evaluate what those proposals are and who are interested in understanding retinal scans. It'd be great if maybe a pharmaceutical company that's building new um, uh, solutions for diabetes had access to millions of retinal scans in a country to be able to, to train their models. They're the ones who are going to pay not million, not 10, but maybe potentially 100 million or more to be able to access that data. So, you know, we have the models, we have the models in place, and we have them here right now. I was going to say, I think, I mean, yes, and this is going to be like an improv session right now, but anyway, uh, <laughs> yes, and on the legal instrument piece, I think a big question to ask is who's defining those legal instruments, right? Because if you are, you know, in the last 10 years, at least if you take the experience of social media and like use that to kind of understand what's, what could possibly happen in the AI space as well. In social media for the last 10 years, IP has been regulated by the DMCA, which is an American um, legislation. The problem with the DMCA is, is that because it was lobbied by US tech companies largely and sort of the US um, broadcasting companies, it predominantly is skewed against people from other parts of the world. So DMCA gets um, weaponized by authoritarian governments by you know, using sort of wrongful IPs and then taking down political content. Um, there is DMCA is being weaponized to like, you know, use things like, for example, Google's right to be forgotten. So there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of implications of how legal instruments designed in one jurisdiction has negative ripple, ripple effects in other parts of the world. So it's really important, and I think coming back to the question on definitions, it's really important to really lay out those definitions up front and have really global cooperation around those because otherwise I think what, what at least our fear is from a Global South perspective is, you know, you have a few legal instruments from a few sort of countries and then these companies which are predominantly based in this countries try to kind of roll out global products using that same legal instrument everywhere. And then essentially you have people in other part in, in these markets uh, who we can't really actually enforce on those legal instruments, or they're, or they're basically um, disadvantaged against it. So, like that's a model, and the and so the other other flip side of that is, if you're saying that okay, fine, these models exist, you know, if you if we're trying to kind of take something like a GDPR and then impl implement it in a different market, for example, the market's infrastructure is not designed for those kinds of legal instruments either. So you don't have the maturity, you don't have the infrastructure, and therefore, even if you were trying to create your own legal instruments the question becomes sort of, uh, is this contextual? Is this relevant? Because all of the ideas, all of the narratives, all of the academics are sitting in a different part of the world. And so essentially, even if you were to take something like a GDPR in a different part of the world, you don't have the maturity within that ecosystem to actually implement the GDPR. And then you have a situation where the few handful of, handful of companies that have the resources to actually implement something as complex as a GDPR they survive and you push out the local competition. And they, they are killed because they are just non-compliant. So you have, a, you have an instance where either you have one legal instrument around the world implemented unilaterally, or you have a copy-paste mechanism where again it's defined in a certain part of the world and then having doing a disservice to other parts of the world, which I think is a problem as you're thinking about the legal environment. Mm -hmm. and can I just pick up briefly? It's also about enforcement as well, because you know, so many countries do not have a like, data protection authority. And, you know, when you're talking about the absolute basics here, I think, you know, it's just, if something is going to be sort of applied globally or, you know, certainly beyond one jurisdiction, then we really have to think about the nuts and bolts behind that. Yeah. yeah I'm going to move us on to a slightly different question. So something I didn't mention at the beginning is the name of this event, Science, Science Times AI Safety, Expecting the Unexpected. And part of the reason of, um, for the name is thinking about how AI might evolve in future, and in particular, thinking about where risk might uh, lead to in future, the sort of unknown uh, unknowns. And unlike other technologies, this is a very general purpose, and therefore there could be all sorts of ways that this um, leads to complicated new risks. So this next question is about 
how we think about risk and how we predict uh, risks in future? Because this will be the key question, I think, that comes after the, after the summit. And I want to start with, with you, Louisa, because the, the main thing that most people probably care about is their jobs. And for you, it'd be interesting to know how you think about this at Unite, like you know, what training is needed, what jobs are going to be automated, how can you predict any of that, and you know, how do you go about that sort of risk assessment in, in the trade union movement? So, I mean, we've obviously got the data impact assessment, um, but it's not obligatory on employers to complete it. And so we are struggling without any regulation at the moment to even be able to find out from employers what, in fact, they are using. And most of them don't actually know what sits behind the system that they're using anyway. So, for instance, if you, if you apply for a job, then that automatic, automated process is going to weed out the first level of applicants. Now, we don't know how they do that. We don't know what unconscious bias is in that system. Like you said, we don't know who wrote that system. There's no appeal to that system. So that's the kind of area where we need to have some transparency and some dialogue with, with the employers about what they are putting into their system. I mean, most people, if you work for an employer, they will have put their HR systems onto your phone. Well, they own your data. Or, or somewhere someone owns your data. It might be that they've sold it to a third party, but you didn't have a choice. You did may, maybe not even add a work phone. It might be your private phone. And it's all done in the name of, you know, ease and access for you to book your holidays when you're at home on a Saturday night watching TV or check your pay slip online. Um, all of that system is what is really what we're talking about at that, at that workplace level. And we have no conversation or right to a conversation about that right now. So part of what the TUC and our manifesto is about people, power and technology so that we know what is going in, what is being used for and the right to say no as to who owns our data. It is our data. We are not an AI lab walking around with a mobile phone sharing everything we put on it with the world. We don't mean to do that. You know, but we are doing that, and we're actually doing it at, often at the request of our employer. And our personal phone and our work phone are, are, are mixing up. And so that whole kind of, you know, description of us that's being collected, that profile of each and every one of us as a citizen and as a worker is just, is just sitting out there. And we're actually being encouraged to do that, and in many cases, obliged to do that by our employer. And when you ask the question, they don't know, because they actually don't, don't know. And we have no legal obligation to inform our members of what it is, because we have no right to get that information from the employer. And that's the level of conversation and debate within the trade union movement about how we regulate. Now, what we do about that, people around this room have all got different reasons, but from a worker's perspective, we have the right to ask and to know and receive and say no to that misuse of our data. Um, instability AI, what is the risk uh, function? What does it look like? Is there a risk register? You know, what's on that risk register? How far into the future does it go? Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about these sort of long-term risks in, in your company? Yeah. Look, I mean, so the focus, the focus as a model developer for us is... Um, really around performance and behavioral risk in the model. Again, because it's a model that can be used in so many different scenarios, so many different use cases, and it's open source, so it can be used by so many different people. We, um, we want to understand the kind of breadth of capabilities in the model, the potential for misuse, behaviors that are undesirable or unsafe or unlawful. And then as far as possible, in the part of the tech stack that we own, the model and in some cases, the API and the application, we want to then put in place mitigations. Um, so for us, you know, we, we do have a, a robust kind of pre-release process, particularly with powerful models like our language and, and image models, where we're thinking through what is the data that is going into the training. We filter it to take out unsafe content, which should make it harder for the model to produce unsafe content. Um, we fine-tune the model for uh, certain kinds of behavioral bias. Um, and, and certain kinds of undesirable behavior. And then we evaluate it. You know, and a good example of what uh, 
external evaluation might look like going forward was DEF CON earlier this year. You know, we were one of, I think, seven or eight companies that fielded a model. We had about 2,000 researchers come in and essentially attack the model uh, to try to elicit undesirable or unlawful responses. Um, and, uh, and that's a great example of how you can use external independent evaluation to test the kind of full envelope of the model's capabilities. That's one piece of it. The other piece is internal red teaming, where we, you know, our researchers probe the model um, themselves. And then there's standardized evaluation. And I, I think this, this is one area that is both underdeveloped but going to be very important going forward for existential risks as well as for kind of behind the frontier risks. You know, we have benchmarks today that look at, you know, take a language model, for example, look at comprehension and reasoning and fluency and, and other things like that. <coughs> They're fairly crude benchmarks in many ways. You know, a lot of work's gone into them. It's, it's really useful uh, uh, as a kind of first assessment of the model. But as we start trying to probe for these more novel or more exotic risks, we need more specialized frameworks that really try to capture, capture that and a kind of battery of tests that a developer can run the model through mm. before they release it. This will become very important when you look at uh, when people think of a model developer, they're typically thinking of a big corporate lab. But what you're now seeing is you can take a base model, you download it from GitHub or Hugging Face, and then thousands of people can now fine-tune the model in ways that are generally very good, that generally makes it safer, more performant. But you can theoretically uh, fine-tune those models uh, for malicious purposes. Um, and so how can we put in place evaluation frameworks for those downstream developers and downstream application deployers so that they understand the risk that they're seeing in their fine-tuned model or in their fine-tuned AI capability? That's you know, an area for further inquiry, but something that we're certainly um, supporting and, and we're working with civil society and government and uh, a number of other organizations to think about what does that look like? What does the future of evaluation look like for the kind of existential risks, but also these more everyday kind of risks as well. Did you want to come in, John? On this? Uh, yeah, I was just going to bring it back to science and safety. So um, E equals MC squared tells you about energy mass equivalence, lets you understand how you might do something interesting, lets you build nuclear weapons. We had an organization called Pugwash, which was voluntary for nuclear physicists to not work on weapons. Uh, DNA, structured DNA, Crick and Watson, and another very important person. But anyway, um, <laughs> Very good, but you could do recombinant DNA, and you can do really bad things with recombinant DNA experiments. So we had Asimova, which is like a conference which like annually decides what we should not do. So I think you know the, the, there is an existential risk which I could, could find hard to quantify, but in the Royal Society had a report about this 10 years ago on governance of climate change, and one of the areas they were interested in was geoengineering, which is now coming around again. And why geoengineering is coming around again is we're hitting 50 degrees wet bulb temperature in some parts of the world for more than a day, where basically, if this happens for a week, you'll have 100 million people die. And countries with launch capability will just stick sulfur in the upper atmosphere immediately because they can do that. And that will drop the temperature by one and a half degrees. You can, that's known science. But it might also move the monsoon 3,000 kilometers away and six months away, which would cause a load of people to starve and no food. So we need to quantify the risk of geoengineering. But it's so complex because it's adding experiments to climate change. You're actually having to do probes, which means we need to run climate models, what if, at scale, 100 to 1,000 times faster than they're currently running. And we need to have uncertainty quantification of the output of those models, otherwise we'll make the wrong decision. And this is not a thing where a person loses his job. We only have one planet, right? So we only get to get this right once or wrong once. So, so that's an area where when people quantify risk, we really, really better do it well. And that is a science modeling thing. And the two, two other examples I gave were you know, from science models, the models came from, you know, biology and physics, this is climate modeling, it's actually you know, fluid flow models and all kinds of interesting things. But, but the only way we can scale our science is to use AI and to make the AI safe for some of these things. We really have to up our game. And the nice thing about upping our game on those is, of course, if we were able to, on those things at scale, 
we it would do all the other things we're asking on desiderata that people have been, you know, with these smaller systems would be quite a lot easier because we'd have solved the problem in a really, really hard space. So that's my last thing I want to say about there is actually one existential risk posed to the human race right now, and we could make it worse if we use AI wrong. Um, so uh, just a reminder that you can submit questions on Slido. The details are on the screen. A2510. We'll go to questions in about 15 minutes. Um, Anna, so you've been in the space for a long time in the human rights space. And obviously, Human Rights Watch is focused more on documenting mm -hmm. uh, abuses. But I'm, I'm guessing you must have thought a lot about prevention long term. And, and I'm interested to know how you might approach the sort of long term risk assessment for a technology that is, is very hard to predict how it goes. Yeah, that's true. And I, I think, you know, there is a component of sort of forecasting in the human rights world, which is, you know, part of human rights due diligence, um, which uh, do you reference, which human rights impact assessments. And again, kind of going back to use case, we would always, you know, recommend that human rights impact assessment was used as part of, you know, social economic kind of impact assessments. And I think, yeah, there's a sort of, you know, in terms of thinking about the, the impact of rights on individuals and the duty bearers' responsibilities and so on and so forth. Um, I think context is very important. And so um, there was a, a great paper out last week, I think, from um, DeepMind's ethics uh, research team about social, techni social technical uh, impact assessment, something along those lines, uh, for, in terms of like forecasting the risk of generative AI. And it's really about sort of situating it in context of what happens, you know, what, what are the kind of live components of that and, um, you know, who's impacted and building on, you know, the work of human rights communities and, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, the kind of whole human rights advocacy movement that is based on participatory methodology around talking to people who the systems are ultimately going to impact and so on and crucially um, creating a means for remedy and redress which is a human right you know you, you need to be able to challenge decisions when you feel that you've been um, sort of maltreated and you need um, to be able to compensate it adequately I would say that if you can't if you're building a system where you can't imagine um, a sort of adequate way to compensate someone that system should not be built frankly Okay, so we've, we've obviously referenced the summit, um, but let's talk about it more directly. Um, and everyone in this room, they will probably have opinions on the summit, and some might be critical of it, some might be supportive of it. Everyone will be focusing on it next week. Um, so interested to know what your views are on the Global AI Safety Summit and what you hope will be achieved at it. I'll start with you, Gina. I'm going to do the unexpected. So... Um, I, you know, the research center that I run, we call ourselves radical rethinkers. So I'm going to say, actually, something that is supportive of the government here. <laughs> yes, that's quite un unexpected. Um, listen, we're going to play the summit we've been dealt. So much about this AI safety summit has nothing to do with the problems of AI and digital technologies and building just digital futures that I work on, right? Just not in my remit. But here in London, there will be five days of packed full of events that are bringing together the community around justice, <coughs> around um, international concerns, around regional concerns around AI, around um, civil society, businesses, basically the entire gen agenda of what AI could be will not be discussed in Bletchley. It'll be discussed in other places. And so we've got to play that card that we've been dealt. But I want to defend the government's framing of the summit because we're in a particular geopolitical context. We're in a moment where tensions are high around the world, you may have noticed, and you're not going to get the US and China at a kumbaya, let's make AI work for the planet AI summit. You're just not <laughs> going to do it. And so if you think about the goals of the AI safety summit as let's create global regulation for AI, it's going to fail. That's not its goal. And it's not the goal that the government, this government has set forth. This government has set forth 
let's talk about this narrow slice that can get some of the most powerful actors in AI to formally sit down together and do the kind of horizon scanning that both John and Ben have said we should be doing. That's gonna happen next week. And if you've looked at the agenda, which they've published, the first day is basically multidisciplinary tables, round tables with 100 or so experts. Not, it's a very small group. And they're going to do this kind of horizon scanning. And I'm a critic, but that doesn't sound like such a bad idea. Now, is global regulation going to come out of that discussion? Absolutely not. Are we going to normalize east-west relations and somehow get a thaw in the um, coming uh, second Cold War that is, that is happening between the US and China over AI? Also probably not, but we're going to get the summit that we've got. And I think there are a lot of really interesting opportunities that can come out of this, this moment. So let me make one more plug. The summit's happening in the UK. It's not happening anywhere else, if you haven't noticed. Um, and that's playing into a certain narrative that we talk about here. And it's playing into a certain narrative of this government in this particular political context, where an election will be called in this country within the next 12 months. That said, you know, we can say the UK, we know the UK is third in the world in terms of the investment and development and research on AI. Not so bad, right? So now, if you narrow that focus and you say, let's look at responsible, trustworthy, and safe AI, let's look just at this focus around the questions and concerns of developing and building out uh, privacy-enhancing technologies in, in investment in responsible and trustworthy AI from a science funder and perspective in, in terms of cultivating um, uh, small and medium enterprises that are working in that exact space, the UK is punching <laughs> above that number three spot. Arguably, it's either number two or number one if you drill just in that responsible, trustworthy, and safe AI bit. So now we have a very different geopolitical map of what's happening at Bletchley, right? The UK gets to assert its um, truly world-leading position in a slice. It gets to play with the, with, the, with the biggest players in the space, and it gets to convene and lay the table for a conversation that cannot officially happen. So when I talk to my colleagues at the State Department, they like humph. Harumph, harumph. We don't understand why China's on the invite list. Harumph. They get to save face. Last week, China, you may have noticed, released um, uh, an announcement where they said they're spinning up their own global AI safety institute mm -hmm. that will be available to their allies in the <laughs> Belt and Road Initiative. Harumph, harumph. <laughs> Everyone gets to save face because they're going to go to Bletchley and have a great time. <laughs> That's a goal of the summit. For the rest of us, we've got work to do. We have five plus days of events around everything else from human rights, labor rights, the global south, yes, research networks, industry, building industry models. We've got so much work to be done. And it's a chance for us to use this opportunity, play the summit we've been dealt, and use it to the advantage to furthering the conversations that we want to have. <laughs> Very good answer. Um, should also add that Adrian Smith, our president, will be at the summit uh, next week and we will hopefully feed in some of these uh, thoughts. Uh, Dia, so obviously this is the Global AI Safety Summit. Have you heard much about it in the sort of countries that you engage with? What are you hoping will, will come out of it? Um, either at the summit itself or in the conversations uh, that surround it. Yeah, and I think I want to build a little bit on what Gina said. I think you know it's it's helpful when you kind of said in that geopolitical context because that's really critical. But I guess the larger question from from sort of a broader global perspective is that there are just so many competing proposals on the table. There is the China approach, the U.S. approach, the Russia approach, the India approach. The East Africa approach, one has its own national -like legislation around AI. There's just a lot of competing proposals on the table. 
So like the question that I'm thinking of and stakeholders that I'm talking to are thinking of is how does it all kind of come together? Does it juxtapose against each other? Um, what is sort of the common sort of thread? And of course, this summit is not going to give us a global regulation on AI, but is it sufficiently intentional about tying these competing proposals into some sort of a narrative, into some sort of a conclusion? And what would that actually look like? Because um, because without that being in place, given the technologies are global, they are interoperable, they are designed predominantly by American and Chinese companies for the, for the larger ones, it's going to be really hard to get any teeth in any of these proposals. So I think that's a, that's a critical question that at least my stakeholders are thinking a lot about. I think the other aspect of that, and I, and I want to kind of talk about just the, just the trust deficit, deficit that exists now between sort of the North and South, right? Because of you know, the most recent one is the pandemic where sort of vaccine deployment was a, was a colossal mess, right? There was a lot of distrust that was reintroduced in an existing inequitable situation where the Global South is now leaning towards partners like BRICS, uh, towards the Bolton Road Initiative, because they just don't think, uh, you know, partner allies or partners like the UK, the US, are really sort of, you know, putting their money uh, where they're making their commitments, right? So there's a there's a lot of trust deficit that now exists across the global south. So the question is going to be, how does the UK navigate that particular trust deficit and kind of getting to where they need to get to? And the third piece of that is around who is in the room. I think you know, it's great to have a hundred people. I would love to know who these hundred people are from a world of seven billion people. Uh, I would love to figure that out because I think more and more. Um, you know, you can't have a handful of nation states and like a couple of private sector companies deciding what's gonna to happen to everybody in the world. And I think that's fundamentally flawed. And, and we've seen more and more how multilateral models when the, it doesn't have equitable participation fail. So a good example of that is the multilateral agreement on investments, uh, the anti-counterfeiting -counter trade agreement, uh, some of the COVID agreements, all of that has failed because a couple of people or a couple of countries who are sort of leading in these spaces are making choices without getting the uh, support and the buy-in of other parts of the world. And then when it comes to actually implement, scale globally, become a global leader, they're just sort of caught off guard because they just don't, they just don't have the buy-in from anybody else in the world. So I think I'll be very curious to figure out um, how you're thinking about um, in inclusiveness, how you're thinking about equitability, and more importantly, how do how do sort of we start thinking more about multi-stakeholder as a model as opposed to multilateralism? Because I think in the last decade, the reason technology regulations has largely has been a bit of a messy spot is because it has followed a very multilateral model, which just doesn't work in something like the internet or AI, which is so much of a public good. So how do you really evolve from a multilateral to a multi-stakeholder model as you're thinking about this summit is going to be a critical question. All right. Ben, have the final say before we go into questions. So Stability AI is one of the companies that will be at the summit. I think you yourself will be at the summit. So what are your expectations going in? What do you hope will, will come out of it? Well, maybe I'll start with what we hope. Um, we hope that um, in a very tactical sense, there'll be a sustained commitment from every government, industry, civil society representative there to support safety across the ecosystem and across the supply chain, not just in a cluster of big models from big labs. Um, what does that mean in practice? That means research, it means evaluation and testing resources, it means standards making, it potentially means regulation, um, but for that to account for this diverse ecosystem and not just focus on one very, very narrow mm. part of it. One very narrow part of it that doesn't need the money, frankly. <laughs> um, there is an academic and grassroots research community that brought AI to this point and um, needs to be resourced and nourished going forward as well. I think in a broader sense, we would hope that people come away from the summit with a, uh, a kind of critical optimism that powerful technology can be developed and deployed safely, even if it is frontier, even if it is powerful. Um, I think the way that frontier and AI have kind of been used as rhetorical crutches over the past year has led us to a place where a lot of people are afraid of technology because they think of the kind of Skynet or, or paperclip examples. And they're not thinking about the circumstances in which you can deploy it, you can develop it safely. 
And so we hope that that is one thing that, that everyone comes away from that summit, a sense that this can be done and it can be done safely um, uh, and, and that you can have an ecosystem that is both open source and closed source, not one or the other, which is how it is tended to be framed. I think in terms of our actual expectations going into it, um, we deal a lot with Washington and Brussels and London and, and Singapore and Tokyo and, and governments around the world. They're all tackling different problems. <laughs> I think this is sometimes lost in, in the public commentary on this, right? The, what the AI Act is attempting to address in Europe is uh, transparency and disclosure and application layer obligations. What certain senators in the US are tackling are existential risk and national security risks. What the UK has committed to in the white paper is a kind of product safety approach where each regulator deals with AI in its own specific domain. Um, and so I think our expectation going into this is that each jurisdiction is tackling a different problem, has different things to show for it, legislation or funding commitments or whatever else. Um, and I think we, we are still unsure about what exactly the consensus will be coming out of that. Hopefully resourcing for a safety institute, hopefully a commitment to harmonizing uh, evaluation research, for example. But beyond that, it's, it's unclear because each country, each regional block is dealing with a very different problem. Great. Uh, just to add on, AI regulation is a field divided by a common language, right? So the same words, even in the US and the UK, the same words are actually meaning and being used in different ways. Absolutely. And I think that's something, you know, if that's, if that's the only thing that happens <laughs> um, over the next week, that'll, that'll be useful for going forward. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Like I think governments around the world, even when we talk to them about explainability, it means so different across different contexts that there is just no common definition, common understanding, and therefore, to Ben's point, we're seeing using the same terminology, tackling entirely different problems, having entirely different proposals on the table, which I think from a pure private sector perspective is a massive compliance burden. So how do you actually stream when that is gonna be, be a critical question? And I hope the summit gives us some direction on that. Okay, let's go to questions. There's some really great ones on the Slido. Um, I'll go to the Slido one first, and then if you think of a question, put your hand up and we'll, we'll send a mic to you. So the most upvoted question is from James Phillips. And the question is, why do key figures of AI like Hinton, Bengio, Altman, Hasabis, Leg, and Altman again, um, unless it's a different one I don't know about, who have driven the cutting edge to take frontier risk much more seriously than you? So we start with John. That's an interesting question. The, the Hinton interview uh, with Eng from Intel um, does not go that far. And, and I think some of these people have actually taken a sort of position that's for performance reasons, you know, and um, maybe to boost the share value of their company, or maybe because they want to distance themselves from where they used to work or whatever. But I, 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 um, I don't think there's some magic great thing about people having 50,000 citations on paper at NeurIPS that means that they have a greater insight into the existential risk and fundamental AGI, as it's normally known, uh, that's going to come out of LLMs, which is not going to happen. Um, this is just simply you know, not the case. And I think the consensus technically is that those statements are not part of a peer-reviewed scientific process, frankly. Uh, and that the community is, I think, what we've expressed is where things are at. Um, if you want a science fiction reference, then Dune had the Butlerian Jihad against AGI 50,000 years before. Anyway, we can discuss that at some other point. Um, but that was about AGI, and these guys are making, were making uh, in, in, in implications that are just not borne out by the reality. Um, by anyone who looked at the work in symbolic AI and neuroscience uh, informed 45 years ago at Sussex University or you know, 30 years ago at Edinburgh or whatever. It's just uh, incorrect, so I'm sorry. Um, I, you know, so that's my position on, on their, their positions. And you know, they, pe lots of people have heard of them much more than me, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> I've run a bilateral drinking game um, at uh, Social Science Foo, which is a gathering that happens at Facebook, uh, co-sponsored by Facebook and O'Reilly Media 
in Silicon Valley, and it brings people from the UK, and somehow I count as one of those people from the UK. <laughs> it brings people from the UK together with people in the US to think about computational social science. And so we um, have both pre and post pandemic run this drinking game um, called first calling BS on AI and um, where someone had to stand up and actually say, I call BS, and they could use foul language. We, of course, in the UK don't use foul language. Um, uh, those Americans. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you could get up and you could say this thing, and then, and, then, and then you would call out, you know, what you're seeing as an AI failure. And we ran it in, in February um, on generative AI. And I, you know, Chatham House rule, but, you know, the, um, Science fiction writer, he is given permission to say, you know, science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson was in the room and he was like, I call BS on AI because it's bad science fiction. And I can say that because I'm a really popular science fiction writer. Like, okay, you, sure, I'll, I'll take that. You know, Meredith Broussard in, in Artificial Unintelligence in her book um, traces this kind of first wave of, of AI pioneers. and and their complicated relationship to, a, to science fiction. And you know, the, the idea that we're scared of these films and we're scared of these books and we're, and we're talking about the capabilities of the models we have today and, and the problems, you know, it's, just, it's just not helpful for how we think about policy. And if I can just ride one more of my hobby horses here. You know, in the last few days, I've seen very well-intentioned op-eds from really bright people, right, who are very good at making technology, and they've been proposing what kinds of policies we need to have, and they've been saying, you know, it'd be great if we could just have an international atomic energy agency for AI. I'm like, dude, <laughs> that's my lane, and let me tell you how many treaties and how many years it took to get to this place. And I don't know if you've read any news about, you know, atomic capability in states and the fraught nature of those conversations, or that we actually have treaty obligations that, that countries have signed up to that that agency is the official assurance agency for. But I don't think you actually want to make that proposal right now. So I think we have to be really careful when we reach for these metaphors Right, without looking at the really hard work of the how. How are we going to implement these things? How are we going to make it happen? Who's going to make it happen? What frameworks are we going to use? Let's just start with what benchmarks do we have? What horizon scanning can we do? What kind of shared language do we have? If we get countries together on a little bit of agreement, or at least agree to talk about those things, then this summit will be a success. So not the Ministry of the Future, then. <laughs> that 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 would be an optimistic look, right? That would be an optimistic look. Let's bring him to royal society in the next few years. Wouldn't that be great? That's a good idea. I think the other thing is that there's, there's actually a lot of nuance in these positions that the, the kind of frontier risk people have taken, and often it's kind of caricatured through the media and by industry as to what their position actually is. There, there is much more consensus on frontier risk, I think, than people suspect, right? I mean, the idea that if you have a system with very high consequence risks, risks that are potentially catastrophic to the entire community, and there are very few countervailing benefits to this system, yeah, like, don't build that thing. <laughs> or, you know, if you do, do it in a very controlled environment. Uh, that, that's sort of unobjectionable to anyone in this, in this space. The question is, empirically, where is that line in the sand? Mm -hmm. There are many people who think that Llama 2 from Meta is a frontier model. It's not a frontier model in the sense that they describe frontier. Lama 2 can do many things. It can do many bad things, mm. but it is not going to destroy the planet. And the idea that a, a company or a research lab building GPT-5 <clears throat> is going to need to obtain kind of sanctioned approval from the US State Department to do so is terrifying. We don't do that in software normally. We have, we have some very narrow instances of technologies and software, uh, uh, zero-day exploits, for example, high-precision GPS, things that you can turn into a missile that are subject to this kind of control regime. Llama 2 is not that. 
And, and the idea of, of only giving a few organizations the authority to develop these things um, is, is unsettling. It comes back to this question mm -hmm. of the how, right? It's mm -hmm. absolutely that there is a potential risk there. Absolutely, we need to be thinking about what evaluation and mitigation look like for those risks. But the idea of jumping in 2023 to some of the legislative proposals that we've seen in the United States and elsewhere is um, it's premature. It's not consistent with how we regulate almost any other technology. Uh, and, it's, and, and those proposals are often coming from people who uh, are very vocal on frontier risk, have potentially worked for a long time in computer science, but um, clearly have not spent a lot of time looking at how we legislate and regulate for these things in a practical sense. And so, you know, I think, I think that's challenging. I think to, to the question, we take it seriously. We've certainly signed up to a few of the statements saying, let's be very careful as we develop technologies that have unforeseen, unpredictable capabilities. Um, but that is different to saying where exactly is that line in the sand? And on the line in the sand question, you have uh, very, very diverse perspectives. Any questions from the floor? Yes, uh, Nikki in the middle. And someone take a mic, Cindy, James, go ahead. Also, if you could um, just say your name, any affiliation, and try to keep it brief, if possible. Okay. Uh, uh, hi, uh, my name is Nikki. I'm with Chatham House. Uh, thank you very much for the very insightful panel. Um, I have uh, the first question is about uh, you know the solutions uh, for AI safety risk because a lot of times um, you know uh, regulators mention about this human in the loop approach, uh, but that based on the um, you know condition that we believe a human is uh, capable of telling what is right or what is wrong uh, from the decisions AI is making. But nowadays we're dealing with a word like AI is shaping the society. Like Gina mentioned, some junior doctors already fighting for training opportunities. If AI is taking over the junior jobs and also, uh, the, also the learning opportunities uh, from human workers, how can we build this experience to be that good, to be able to tell uh, whether human uh, AI decisions is right or wrong? If we are not having this uh, capacity as a as a human, is this uh, some sort of like AI safety risks that concerns the panel? Thank you. Anyone want to come in on this? Yeah, perhaps when people talk about human in the loop, often it is people sometimes in the global south. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this or anyone else on the panel? Yeah, I mean, I, think start. I mean, I think the first part of your question was about what kind of solutions could potentially exist. And I think um, it really goes down back to the basics because it goes back to the initial definitions of AI versus automated versus all of that, right? So if you take the very basic of it, how do you really safeguard against those kinds of risks? So that's better data protection laws, better consumer protection laws, better IP protections, better labor, better labor protections, better environment laws. Those things already exist to some capacity. So the question is how do you kind of take these existing legislative models and then think about some of the changes you would have to make in order for this to also apply in those particular contexts because, and I think the viewpoint that at least I take is, you know, policy making is really expensive. Uh, and, and especially if you are a resource trapped government or a resource trapped state, you have a bunch of things you have to really worry about too, like I think Anna's point earlier. So if you are trying to also mitigate those kinds of safety risks, you're also worried about that, then how do you leverage your existing frameworks to then be also able to provide certain kinds of safeguards against um, AI models or automated systems. So I think that's a really big part of it. And I think the other aspect of that, there's a, there's a lot of focus on human in the loop. And I think it, for me, it kind of goes back to the old argument around if you had hired 100 million content moderators, all the child sexual pornography would have been gone. Like it, it really doesn't work that way. So I think the question is, it is really important to have a human in the loop, but the broader question is sort of, how do you think of it at the design level to ensure that you're building systems that are safe, or you're kind of drawing that line? And if it's, if it's just bad, if it's, if it's a system that's about predicting social credit scores, just don't build it. That's pretty, that's, that's pretty straightforward as that. Louise, do you have any questions? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of reassured by what Ben's been saying about the whole framework of the safe debate you know but in terms of in, in terms of the systems they're there they're not going away we have to we have to work with them and we have to embrace change and innovation we have to ensure that people are trained correctly and we need to make sure that as we develop new new roles or, or new systems we've got workers that are trained to go with it but we're not 
you know, we're not, we can't stop it. Innovation is something we all embrace. And therefore, you know, this is going to move on and we need to move on with it. But the, the frameworks and the regulations that will come during the debate will, will, will help us get there, right? But when, when the, you take a human out of the loop, then that you have to find something else to guard it. And it, 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 I think there always has to be a human intervention where you've got people, where you've got workers. But a lot of this won't need human intervention. It will need protections and guards and frameworks around it. So I think there's two different debates going on. One about how we grow the infrastructure and the machinery and then how we guard against the worker. But where we, where we grow the machinery and the, we develop the AI... I think we are very supportive and, re and really welcoming that. I think as, as, a, as a kind of citizen, we're scared. We don't know what it means. We listen to the media, we listen to the, you know, the debate, but we actually aren't getting those reassurances, the kind of conversation that Ben's having about how it's got to be safe, how it's got to be protected. That needs to be a debate with people so that we're not having a scientific discussion and a government discussion, but, but an understanding in society of what's coming at us. You know, we hear about, oh, it's going to be a bus with no person. It's going to be, well, yeah, OK. And as you said before, you know, do they really fly the planes? Have they been flying them for a long time? Or you feel safe when you're in the plane anyway? So it's this kind of mixed message. You know, we embrace technology. We work with innovation. We just need to make sure that we understand it's transparent and explained properly so that people will embrace, not be frightened. And actually, just to, there was a point in there around um, that the people aspect of this is interesting because a safe outcome or a good outcome with AI means very different things in different contexts, right? So if you're saying, does the NHS AI chatbot tell you to drink bleach to fix your COVID infection, right? Like, that's a kind of basic product safety problem in many ways, and regulators know how to deal with that, right? You look at the reliability of the system. How often does it give you a harmful response? How often does it give you a helpful response? But then you look at other issues like the, the doctor's example you gave. Another example of this is kind of the SAG-AFTRA strike in the, in the United States, and, um, and actors who are concerned about systems, AI or not, that um, are able to replicate their physical likeness, their performance, right? And, uh, and what does that do to background actors, extras? What does it do to pathways into the acting industry in Hollywood? The problem there is less a how do we evaluate the system problem, right? The problem there is a kind of bargaining imbalance problem between, in this case, actors and studios, and how is technology going to affect that bargaining imbalance? Um, and so, you know, in, in, in a funny way, and, and, you know, certainly have to be sensitive about how we talk about this from the tech side of the lecture, but the WGA's approach, the writing, the writing guild's approach to dealing with this and the negotiations that they held with the, the producers and the studios was really interesting. It was a really interesting look at how, how are you going to address some of these problems in a non-scientific way and a non-regulatory environment. You know, where, where does bargaining and, and other systems kind of come into play there? Um, so it's something we're, we're following with, with interest, what that looks like. You know, we, we certainly, as, as a model developer, we want to build tools that help with tasks, right? You push a button, get an image. Push a button, get a poem is kind of a caricature for how these systems are going to be used. Like, fundamentally, we're seeing Broadway designers use them to mock up new concepts for the stage. You know, we're seeing uh, people using them for analysis and classification tasks, medical research teams using stable diffusion to take MRI scans and see if they can visualize what the patient was seeing and what could that do to medical diagnostic uh, approaches for different neurological disorders, right? There, there are functional use cases for all of this that aren't um, a kind of wholesale replacement for a person or a job. And that's the kind of thing that we want to build. But we, we need to have this conversation with, uh, with users and with creators and with workers who may be affected directly or indirectly to make sure that we're kind of keeping to that mission. Um, I'm going to move us on to another question because there's a lot of good ones. We're running out of time. <clears throat> um, so on Slido, we've got one from Ziski from Wikimedia. Uh, a question that I think will interest a lot of people in um, the political world. So what guardrails or coordination is essential to put in place around the use of generative AI tools 
ahead of a year with over 40 countries holding elections. And Anna, I'd like to start with you. Oh, God. <laughs> um, no, it's funny. I was at a um, round table with a bunch of tech companies a couple of weeks ago discussing exactly this, and I genuinely don't think that anyone has a, has a good answer for it. You know, I think, like, really, it's a sort of wait and see in some ways. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are things you can do in terms of, like, guard, you know, sort of... Um, putting you know sort of uh, mitigating factors in place whether that's um all of the kind of technical aspects um that ben ran through but then at, at the end of the day i think you know just sort of we're going to need more investment and more resources when it comes to content moderation when it comes to you know enforcement of policies and so on and that's something that kind of concerns me particularly with regards to the discrepancies between one country and another and where the resources are going sort of globally is not equally I think you know one I think sort of if I look at something like the DSA or the DMA um, cynically I think that the tech companies are going to put a lot of resource into um, sort of showing kind of transparency um, measures that they're making in Europe because it's you know, it's going to be public. And I think if we could have that level of transparency globally, I mean, my kind of answer to a lot of these questions is sort of, you know, let's shine some light on it and we need transparency. You know, if, if anything from sort of algorithmic registers around kind of public use of, of AI to, um, yeah, kind of like sort of uh, understanding the resources that are going in from tech companies in specific countries, um, I think particularly with regards to elections, that would be a great help. Don't know if anyone else. Let's actually move on because I, I want to try and squeeze in some more questions before we close. Uh, any more questions on the floor? Yes, the gentleman in the jumper and the shirt. <laughs> 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 uh, clearly, I would never get a job on BBC <laughs> Question Time. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, good evening. I'm Siddhan Chatterjee from Holistic AI. My question is for Dia and Ben specifically. Um, increasingly, the trust and safety ecosystem is utilizing and leveraging generative AI to create synthetic training data to train um, you know, content moderation classifiers, hashes, hashes etc. My question is, how do you ensure that, that synthetic training data in itself is representative, is bias-free, or you know, risk to bias are reasonably mitigated? What are the considerations that can be used to underpin that? How does that happen in practice? And more generally, do you think regulation has a play here? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I, I think it's important to acknowledge, especially given this headlines around this issue, that synthetic data can be used in a number of ways as part of developing one of these models. I think the most interesting example of this is um, actually from the kind of the driverless car world, right, where you have vehicles that are trained obviously on a lot of real world data, but then you're also using synthetic data to expose the model to scenarios that are very important, but it's very unlikely to encounter in the real world, right? The car needs to drive on the real world to understand the nuance of pedestrians and cats and soccer balls and things like that. But you also need the vehicle to know what happens if a, an oil tanker drives onto the wrong side of the road. And that's not gonna happen every day. Um, the same is true in generative AI. You, use, you can use synthetic data to expose the model to edge cases that it wouldn't otherwise encounter. You can also use synthetic data to correct for certain biases that you otherwise can't correct for in real world data. Um, we do a lot of work with our image and language models thinking through how can we make them um, more representative and correct for many of the biases that exist in, for example, the internet. <laughs> um, you know, one of our language models is currently the most capable open source Japanese language model. Our uh, image models have gone through a whole bunch of work to fine tune and correct for some of these behaviors, in some cases using um, uh, synthetic forms of, of, of data. So I think it's, it, it's not, the, I think media has spoken about this in the context of a, um, a kind of doom loop where AI sort of feeds on AI content and it just becomes kind of cyclical and recurring and eventually everything implodes. The reality is synthetic data has been used in much more limited ways and most of those applications, at least in, in our experience, have been around correcting for bias and, and making the model more representative. Yeah, I think there's two uh, parts to it. I think, you know, a few months ago I was in a hackathon where we tried to kind of lean on synthetic media to be able to train better trust and safety models because, to Ben's point, 
you're not going to get right now the way harm is determined is when it actually happens on a platform and then you do something about it, which is very reactive. So if you were trying to try take a more proactive approach to it, could you then use synthetic media to be able to predict as many harm scenarios as possible, qualified across as many cultures and other kinds of diversity indicators as possible, and then understand how that harm is being happening. So I think there is a positive use case to that, and I think that Hackathon was kind of trying to explain that, but I think a big part of that is in terms of representation is that the existing data systems they don't really have that. So you have to be quite intentional about how you're, um, in, when you're trying to even correct it, how you're kind of being very representative about it. And so I, I think there is some really good work happening, for example, in Southern Africa, where they're like trying to build out more training data to be able to inform synthetic data, data and then to be able to then create more representative models. I think there's a good work happening in South Asia on that as well. But I do think it really comes down to, at the, again, that the data collection level, are you, one, getting diverse data sets, representative data sets, two, I think, uh, in terms of just the different modes of data collection that you're doing. So for example, right now it's predominantly in English. Are you getting multiple languages? Uh, global subpopulations converse largely in audio, video, and not actually text. So are you then using the sort of different ways of collecting like different forms of data collection? So I think there's different aspects to certain cultures that needs to be baked into the data collection phase that then essentially informs the design phase. So it's a bit more at the supply chain le level as opposed to the application level. And I think being very intentional about it from the very beginning is potentially the only way to address some of the synthetic media question that you're asking. I want to move, I want to move on to the next question. Um, the so important add-on. Go on then. You know, one of the reasons for doing synthetic data is you can give synthetic data to other people, but in the process you have to do differential privacy, which means you usually reduce the precision about rare cases, which may be the interesting ones. There's recent work in the Turing Institute with the Financial Conduct Authority and ONS in fixing that problem to a large degree. So you need to look at literally the last year's Europe's papers in this space, because things have improved at the representativeness of the data in the tailors of the distribution, which matter if you care about that, because there are other lots of other uses of synthetic data. I'm, I'm glad you did say that, actually, because you set me up nicely to mention that the Royal Society has two reports on privacy enhancing technologies, which also covers <laughs> synthetic data. Um, we're going to take another question from Slido, which is from Spicy Takes. And lower your hopes, because it's not really a Spicy Take, this question. This is a very normal question. So um, what is the role of universities? I'm going to give this to Gina to answer. What is the role of universities in supporting AI for science? given that they are behind the cutting edge and do not have access to data, computes, and high salaries? Uh, I told you, it's not a spicy take, is it? That's, can we? So, it. so um, <laughs> at the Royal Society today, we actually spent the morning working on horizon scanning on AI for science. Um, yeah, you've named all the problems. Um, I could add 10 more when you have the head of a university, the president of a university here in the UK saying, yes, and the sector's going to collapse. That's another problem. Um, listen, uh, academic research has a lot of things going for it. I don't know how I'm going to finish the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Time is one of the things we do have. And, and academic researchers are um, empowered um, by curiosity, they're empowered to work on problems where they can have time to discover. Some of the research that I've done on how teams take on uh, AI and other technologies to, to do new kinds of collaboration show that sometimes just bringing advanced tools into the lab allow people to ask new kinds of questions. And not to say that doesn't happen in industry, but in industry, yes, there's more money and more compute and more power, perhaps, but time is not the resource they have. And they don't have the resource to be curiosity-driven in most cases, right? They, there's a product, there's a bottom line, there's a manager. And there's really smart people and interesting problems, and you know, my colleagues in industry love their work, so I don't want to belittle that. So, so yes, um, we need a lot to keep universities competitive, and I'm going to make one more plug. We need a lot in this country to keep our universities competitive. Um, it's, it's not simply about compute. It's not simply about the salaries. 
It truly is how are we investing in people and how are those people being empowered in universities to continue focusing on curiosity. We came up with the conclusion at the table that Arika and I were at, the round table we were at today, really that you know people want in universities, scientists want to do good and they want to do good work. It's a huge motivation for those of us. So can we please get what the basics we need to ensure that our science in this country does not collapse. Really could talk about this all night, but unfortunately it's 8.30, which means uh, that brings us to the close of our event. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. I hope you learned something new. And as you may have noticed, I mentioned many policy reports. You <laughs> should read them. If you really want to understand these uh, topics well, you have to read, you can't just listen to a podcast. And you know, where better to read than a Royal Society publication. Finally, can we have a round of applause for our excellent panel and everyone who helped put together this event and the whole day today? Thank you. <laughs>